So I'm going to invite each and every one of you to be a restorative justice theorist and a restorative justice practitioner. Sometimes we separate them. These are our theory people, and these are our you know, researchers, and these are our practitioners. We're all researchers, finding a new way forward. We're all theorists, and we are all practitioners. So I want you to think about critically, what's your theory of restorative justice? Do you first say we focus on the harm done? Do you focus on relationships? What's your elevator pitch? What is your elevator pitch for restorative justice? How are you defining it? How are you showing up in the world about you know, this idea of restorative justice? So if each and every one of us is, both, is all of that, researcher, theorist, practitioner, I think my job as in tertiary education is to be all of that. And most importantly, to lay the groundwork for the students to be the, the, the practitioners that come behind me. And for me to get out of my ivory tower and into my community. So really think about what we're learning together and how we're learning together. I'm going to tell you two stories. I'm going to wave in a little bit of theory because I've had the great privilege to learn from some of the, the bigger formal theorists in the world. Um, and then uh, and I'm, it's in, and it sort of invites you on a little bit of my journey and it also, um, it also helps me know what I need to do as an educator in tertiary education. So my very f I started my work in Canberra, Australia. Um, and I was invited to participate and observe as the expert a restorative justice conference. At this time in Canberra, we were, they were, this particular case was diverted to police, and it was a police officer that was facilitating the case. And this young man had vandalized um, a school. And invited to this particular conference were his parents, uh, the school principal, the teacher, and his grandmother. And we all turned up, and we were listening to this young man. And he, he, um, he was, like, not impressed at all. And his sort of posturing was like this. He was sort of proud that he vandalized the school. And as the police officer wagged his finger at him, he was still proud. And as the principal wagged his finger at him, he was even prouder. And as the teacher, whose classroom was vandalized, wagged his finger at him, he was even prouder. And then his, his parents were feeling so much shame that they were like, didn't know what to say. And it wasn't until his grandmother spoke that everything shifted. Because the grandmother, who had always been there for Johnny, you know, she didn't go to bingo anymore. And bingo was where she hung out with her friends. She looked forward to it every week. And so he wasn't going, she wasn't going to bingo anymore. And even though Johnny was mad at the school, he, was, he didn't, never expected it, his behavior to affect his grandmother. And so that's when everything shifted in the room. There was that emotional contagion of what went wrong. And that's when everyone started stepping up. So, so it sounded like it was pretty good, like he got the emotional shift. Things were moving, he got it, that he had caused harm to the school. But what was never addressed in that first conference that I observed more than 15 years ago was why he was mad at the school. We never addressed that issue at all. But he was now compliant with the school rules, he acknowledged the harm done to the school, but we never worked on why he was mad with the school. And so one of my teachers was John Braithwaite, and he always couples restorative justice with responsive regulation. And that sort of mar marrying the change that we want at the individual level with the change that we want at the institutional level. Change has to happen hand in hand we rely on individual change case by case, we're never going to get there. So responsive regulation means disaggregating the data. 
Who's excluding? Who are we excluding? Who are we not? Race makes a big difference. We have to change the pedagogy of how we keep kids in schools and the knowledges that we bring into schools. We have to welcome indigenous knowledges. In Canada, it's our indigenous people who are systematically um, pushed out of school and into our criminal justice system. It's an embarrassment for all of us. It shouldn't happen. So we need to look at, to be a responsive institution, we need to look at our data and bring in different knowledges. There's many reasons why kids are systematically pushed out of school. And if we just rely on individual change, we're not going to get there. The change has to be at a systemic level as well, and institutions have to start stepping up to that challenge. Um, so the other, one of my other teachers was uh, Val Braithwaite, and she talks about motivational postures. So we are, often in the context of restorative justice, we default to interpersonal relationships. That's what we're marrying. We're sort of reconciling and repairing the harm done at an interpersonal level. And so that's repairing horizontal relationships. But we also have relationships with institutions, and I call those vertical relationships. And so we need to start thinking about our relationships with institutions and how we're working on that level of relationship. So Val has an analogy. It's a high, high jump sort of analogy. And some of our kids, and our challenge in schools is to keep raising the bar. Primary, secondary, tertiary education. We're always raising the bar because we want them to keep, you know, clearing the bar. And some of our kids, we equip really well to clear that bar every year. So the next sort of group of kids are sort of capitulated. Every, we, we raise the bar and sometimes we get there and we clear the bar and sometimes we don't. But we keep trying because we want to be good citizens. We want to be good actors in the school and we want that to happen. There's another group of kids and their job similar to the, the young boy that I was just talking about. They see the bar, and because the school has never really done the right thing to them, their, their job is to knock down their stupid bar every single time. Because the, school, the institution hasn't really turned up with, for them in a good way. So their job is to knock down the bar. The next group of kids, the disengagers, the school puts out the bar, and they don't even care about the bar anymore. They're you know, walking out the back door. So we have to raise the bar for all of us and find, give the kids in schools all the resources they need to clear the bar so they're not walking out the back door. So they're turning up in a good way. So the re responsibility is reciprocal. And our institutions, it's at the institutional level that are the biggest challenges. We have to change the way our institutions are, st are stepping up for our kids and can't expect all the change at the individual level. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm going to tell you one more last story. <laughs> um, so, and part of it is just turning up in our communities. So there was, and this sort of relates to what you focus on. Do you focus on the harm done or not? So there was one day in my life, um, and uh, I, got, I started getting a lot of calls because there was a terrible incident in the school that's sort of in my own backyard and people were phoning me not because I was the expert but this was my community Whew. Uh, this was my community and I was a fellow parent at the school and so they started phoning me and because there was a young girl that had been allegedly bullied in school and she, um, and she wasn't having a very good time and so she self um, selected to just go up to, the, to the, the principal's room and have a little time out. But there was no one there, so she phoned her parents, said, it's happened again, and this par particular parent reached the tipping point. And um, she turned up at the school with two of the other, uh, her two other children, and they basically barricaded the classroom and verbally rampaged the entire classroom, teachers, kids. There was kids under this, the desk, the teacher was in tears, and by the end of the day, the, the, the mother had a, uh, um, a restraining order against her, and, and, the, and the story was fracturing across the community. And uh, everyone's phoning me, and what I did notice is that every time I picked up the phone, people had different stories. 
And the story of what happened that day was, was coalescing a bit around different parent groups. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is just crazy. And everyone's going, you've got to do something. And, and, te- and teachers were, or parents were saying, you know, wanting demands that from the institution, from the school. But the school couldn't speak on behalf of the, in, anybody that day. They couldn't because of privacy concerns and a number of different concerns. The school couldn't do anything because they had responsibilities and there's privacy to be aware of. So what happened in the end was that we can only speak for ourselves. And so we invited every parent that was in that, I'm very sorry, every parent, (laughs) every parent that was um, uh, in that particular classroom, we just invited them to voluntarily show up. And they did, um, including the father. And I didn't know if I had a safe space anymore. And I couldn't focus on repairing the harm done. I had to fall, you know, throw all that training about pre-meetings and what out of the door. But I wanted, we needed to have the conversation because it was fracturing the community. And so we, um, we all, I only said, I can't repair the harm done, but the only thing I can do is bring us to a common story. That's the only thing I can do today. The only thing I can do in a good way is to have a common story so our, our community isn't fracturing anymore. But remarkably, one very brave member of our community reached out to the parents. I live on your, own, your same street. And I feel, I know what's happening to your family and I've never reached out to you. And so the father that was in the circle at the school went home told the mother what to do. The mother walked down the hall, or walked down the street to the other mother's house. They had a heart to heart. She voluntarily wrote a letter of apology to the entire school the next day. And most importantly, there too, it was like, this was like three days before the school was closing for the summer. Those two young girls that lived on the same street played all summer long. They had new friends. And we weren't focusing on repairing the harm done, but it was done. We just wanted a common story to share so we could feel pride in our community again. So that's it. I'm way over. I'm very apologetic. So just greetings from the, our, one of my teachings from the Coast Salish people is it's our job to hold each other up, so I hope we do so. Thanks so much.